Hi, I'm Dr Julian Segan from Melbourne, Australia. I'm reporting to you from Room Now. Uh, we're at the ACR Convergence in 2022 in sunny Philadelphia. So I'm here with Dr Brian England. Uh, I wanted to interview uh, Brian about uh, his abstract 0245, the influence of forced vital, vital capacity, impairment on treatment selection and outcomes in rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease in patients initiating a biologic or targeted synthetic DMARD. Thank you for coming on, uh, Dr England. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here, back in person. Very exciting, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, so could you tell us a bit about the, uh, the main findings of the abstract? Yeah, so, you know, the abstract really gets us this idea of how should we manage patients with rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. It's a very challenging population, as you're well aware of, to take care of. We don't have a lot of data to guide us. And so really the premise behind the abstract is, is, is one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of data because we don't know which therapies to choose, you know, which of our immunomodulatory therapies might be best for these patients. And we really wanted to try and get at the question of, well, what's driving both the choice of which therapy we should give these patients, as well as what's driving the outcomes after these patients receive advanced immunomodulatory therapies. So utilizing uh, national VA data over a large period of time, we looked at what the predictors were of either receiving a non-TNF or JAK inhibitor versus a TNF inhibitor in people who have RAILD. Then we looked at what the outcomes were afterwards, what things predicted whether they were in the hospital, what things predicted whether they ended up dying over those few years after initiating that therapy. And the key thing that we really wanted to look at that studies haven't looked at such f so far is the severity of their ILD. And we know a great surrogate marker of their ILD severity is their forced vital capacity. And so we extracted forced vital capacity measurements out of the electronic health record. Uh, some of it was available, some of it we had to use natural language processing to extract out. And what we found was that the forced vital capacity, as we might expect, is highly predictive of their outcomes. It predicted people going to the hospital for a respiratory complaint. It predicted people dying after they'd initiated an advanced therapy. But what was a little bit surprising was the forced vital capacity severity was not a strong predictor of which therapy people were getting. And I think that's a little bit eye-opening to this idea that what we clearly know that how severe your ILD is is going to impact whether or not you live or die. But we still don't know whether or not that means we should treat you differently. So there's clearly a lot of work to be done to figure out how to best treat these patients. So why do you think that severity of the ILD didn't predict uh, the treatment choices? Is it the fact that we don't know how to treat this disease? Is it, is it, are there other factors like uh, availability of certain medications with insurance coverage? Yeah, I think it's both. I think absolutely it's both. You know, we don't have any clinical trial data of our immunomodulatory therapies and RA ILD. And so that's a, that's a huge gap that we need to solve going forward. But the other piece is exactly that. You know, so when we don't have that data, what drives our treatment decisions is the things we have. So when we looked at our data, it was, yeah, more current time periods where we had more options, we were more likely to go to a non-TNF or a JAK. You know, if people had had, you know, numerous prior biologic therapies, they were more likely to end up on a non-TNF. Kind of, you know, the severity of their RA, their articular disease, pushed people that way. So um, I guess one of the questions I had based on the mortality and the outcome data was, uh, do you think that the treatment actually influenced some of the respiratory related hospitalizations and some of the mortality? Or do you think that that was, uh, that was independent or even perhaps protective like some of the methotrexate data? Yes. I think all of those above. That's a great question, right? <laughs> yep. You know, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, we know there are some complications that can happen. You know, every therapy has been implicated for drug-induced pneumonitis. We know these are immunomodulatory therapies. And what's the big infection we worry about in people with RAILD? What's well, pneumonia, right? Someone gets a pneumonia who's already got severe parenchymal damage in their lungs. It can be devastating. So I think there's definitely the potential for badness with these therapies. Now, whether or not there's benefit from them, that remains to be determined. As we both have talked before, you know, there's a lot of uncontrolled studies that suggest you know, the vast majority of people with RALD who initiate these advanced therapies are either stable or maybe even have a little bit of improvement. But what's lacking is that comparative data. You know? What's lacking is accounting for how severe their articular disease is, how severe their interstitial lung disease is. If we compare these therapies, which therapies are patients going to do better with? You know? And we don't have that clinical trial data. We don't even have that comparative observational data for the most part. Yeah, so that leads me on to really the elephant in the room. How do we get that data? We, I think it's probably unlikely that we're going to have big phase three trials. So how do we get the data to actually answer those questions? Well, I think that's where we have to look at the real world, right? What's happening in the real world? Have we treated enough people with these therapies in the real world that we can now look back 
and you know use pharmacoepidemiologic principles and study designs to try and tease that apart. And this study is really a first step towards doing that. First step is understanding what's driving treatment selection, what's driving treatment outcomes, and now that we know that information, you know, let's simulate a randomized controlled trial with real world data. Yeah. And a final question. My colleagues at home would probably kill me if I didn't ask one of the experts. What are your go-to drugs based on your clinical experience or even some of the, the, um, the low levels of data? What are your go-to therapies for RAILD? Well, it depends. You know, I would say that, you know, there's not one that is so good that blanket for all RAILD patients I'd head this way. The first step is really taking a detailed assessment of what is this person's RAILD, right? It's not just their lungs. These people have articular disease. And so it's, it's doing a full assessment of what is the systemic nature of their disease, what organs are being involved, uh, how is it impacting their quality of life and what they want to function, and from that kind of tailoring, you know, the medication selection. Um, you know, oftentimes for people who are on conventional therapies, you know, azathioprine is a reasonable option to consider. Uh, for people who are, you know, requiring biologic therapies, uh, you know, certainly we use plenty of uh, rituximab, rabitacept, um, but it really just, it's patient by patient at this point, and there's no data to drive it. It's all experience. So to all the people at home, I'm sorry that we don't have a better answer, but hopefully Dr. England will come up with a, with a better answer with more time and more data. So I just want to thank Dr. England again for his time and expertise. Uh, really interesting uh, and, uh, topic and uh, very amazing abstracts. Uh, so thank you for your time. Well, thanks so much for having me. So I'm Julian Segan for, for Room Now, and uh, join us uh, for more coverage of the ACR 2022 in Philadelphia.